lots of training, and I'm thankful for a couple things, like uh, being politically neutral uh -huh. was a big teaching, and uh, I, I still cling to that. It's helped me tremendously, you know, because you in that position, you can see – you can Shoot. There you are. I'm sorry. It cut out again. I, I heard you say in that position I could see, then that was it. Oh, okay. Yeah. And if, if this happens again, I'll, I'll, I will pick up the table and move it over okay. <laughs> to a different area. Um, yeah, in that position of politically neutral, you can see very clearly the left and the right and all that. You know, uh -huh. so. uh, I have been gone from that organization for about 10 years. And uh, the catalyst for that was uh, my wife leaving me. And she was a witness as well. And uh, it's not worth getting into, but <laughs> when uh, that institution of marriage is so focused upon and the only way out is death or adultery. Yeah. So that means you have to be a sinner and disgrace yourself and God, quote unquote, uh, in order to get out of something that's not working, you know? Wow. That's pretty messed up. Yeah. And so it, it can cause, well, cognitive dissonance, you know, which is a great catalyst for other things, right? <laughs> yeah. Makes the world go around. Sadly. And so you start questioning everything because it doesn't make sense, you know, and then you question the whole entire thing. But I read a book that helped, uh, which was called um, Misquoting Jesus. And uh, the story, I do believe uh, this guy was Episcopal, and he was a teenager, and some born-agains came through town, and he got hooked on it, and he loved the energy and the fervor, and uh, he became a fundamentalist Christian. Mm -hmm. Um he went to a Christian college, but they couldn't teach him everything he needed to know to be a scholar. His idea was, we need Christians to be scholars to read the Dead Sea Scrolls and all this so that we can get, you know, truthful, accurate information, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, at the conclusion of his book, to make it a short story, uh, he realized not only do we have – we don't have the word of God or not only do we not have the, the word of Christ, we don't even have the word of God, you know, cause it's been so messed with and he found so such evident proof of it being messed with. So I'm like, Whoa, you know, um, started to look into, well, what is the truth, you know, and asking those questions. Is that true? Is this true? Is it true that they told me this? You know, and so in fact, I've been taking notes copiously for about eight years. Anytime I come across something that really strikes a chord, I start writing. And uh, I figured I'd write a book. Uh, and when, like, the first chapter has to be, how much do you care about truth? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? Is it relative? Is it is there subjective truth and objective truth and and all that kind of thing? So. Um, and I even have a lot of truth quotes, but anyway, um, demonology, the reason why that struck a chord with me in your book is that, uh, I was 15 at the time and I was introduced to a gentleman, uh, uh, his name is Stu. We'll just keep it at that. <laughs> and, uh, he, um, had a lot of demon stories to tell. Mm -hmm. And in, of course, the Christian framing of that a demon is a fallen angel but what never made sense to me was if you're in the presence of the almighty what could possibly cause you to deviate so far as to torment humans on a daily basis like strangling them in their sleep or rattling things around the room or you know just giving them a hard time mm -hmm. you know and so uh, witnesses do not believe in ghosts uh, because there is no spirits because they really believe that they don't believe in a soul. Yeah, they don't believe in the soul. Really, really. 
Yeah, they're the only Christians that I don't I don't know if there's any other denomination that does. But see, witnesses are kind of like the Vulcans of the Christian world. Okay. Everything is logic and reason. There's no emotion. You know, um, you're not going to find them at a tent revival rolling on the floor. Mm-hmm. They're going to come in with their books. It's going to be very very scholarly. It's question answer type of things, and their their sole focus is preach this good news throughout the world. That's what they. They need to do, you know, get the word out there. So, uh, so in that frame, he told me a lot of interesting little tales. And so now, uh, putting some of the pieces together, it's very interesting that it's more of a AI or an algorithm, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of, now, how did you come about discovering that little tidbit? Because I know you have a Christian background as well. Well, um, should be okay. Sorry, my dogs have just ran down the stairs at a neighbor. I think they're going to be okay, though. I think they'll be fine. Um, I, uh, I, I was raised Episcopal. Um, I was told, uh, you know, I was told I'm going to hell and stuff and, you know, what everyone was. And, and, and during Sunday school, I was, I was, uh, I remember I was called Lucifer once. I was asking questions that just really now, at the, the teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Like the Sunday school teacher. authority figure that called you Lucifer. What a wonderful person. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, it, it she just really didn't like my questions and she didn't uh, like the persistence of it, which was, was fine. I mean, and really it wasn't like a direct, she wasn't trying to attack me. That was just, you know, I guess she figured that would shut me up, but uh-huh. it, when, when you add that with like, when I watched the exorcist, I was way too young to see the movie, the exorcist. And when I had asked Jesus into my heart, I remember doing that. I remember telling my mom that I did it and I remember feeling something. And I remember my mom's reaction to me feeling something was like, you're not supposed to feel anything. Wait, you felt wow. something? What, what you, like she didn't say that. That's not what she said. I'm just telling you that this is the feeling that I read from the room was that experiencing that was not what she was expecting, which I thought was weird because it's like, well, what are we doing here? Like what, why are we doing the baptism? And now we're talking about a confirmation and like, what is the purpose here? Like if I can't ask questions and if I can't even really share with my mom, you know, like what's happening, what does it all mean? And uh, yeah, I just kept growing like all of us do. No one really was giving me any answers. And it, it got so bad that in college I changed my major to religion I just really wanted to figure out what the fuck was going on. Oh, wow. And uh, it, it, it was also haunted by, uh, by a woman. Um, I, I, I keep falling, I've fallen in love in my life a lot with unavailable women. Like, like I just, I really, really just fall deeply in love with them. And so it was causing a lot of pain and depression. And um, everyone around me was like, well, you just need Jesus. And I kept trying to add Jesus to fix that, but it, no, that wasn't helping at all. It was, it was actually the, the last, it was probably the worst thing was happening. Not to say that I, that I shouldn't have religion, but that I was trying to fill uh, a hole in my solar plexus with something from outside of myself. Like it was just, I'm going to stick cotton from outside of myself. It's not really fixing myself. I'm just kind of doing this thing. So, you know, I went through religion and, and studied that, studied philosophy just tried to figure shit out and it's I've just always been on an ever ending quest to really nail it, like to really, really nail what's going on. And when I unwrapped, it, it sounds crazy. It, it's not crazy, but people get really upset at this, but the only quote, quote, demon, ethereal spirit, I should say, cause it, it, it'll sound terrible cause I'm calling it a demon, but the only ethereal spirit that I personally have ever interacted with was the Holy Ghost of Jesus Christ. When I asked him into my heart, I physically felt a sensation. And that would be the closest thing that I've ever had in my entire life is some sort of demonic uh, interaction. Yeah, and you you mean it in the sense of uh, a demon isn't necessarily good or bad or right and wrong? The very first, yeah, yeah. In fact, I go back to the original definition, D-A-I-O-M-O-N, is, what the, uh, and and you're a you're a computer um, programmer too, right? Right, right. I do I do, yeah. I do WordPress consulting, so uh, I've dabbled with a little bit of PHP code, but I'm by no means a coder. I'll go in and fix a script to do mm-hmm. something 
it's already written to do it a little bit more my way, but other than that, you know. Yeah. So I appreciate I appreciate the analogies uh, in it. Uh, Neil Kramer, same thing too. He was doing some sort of programming. Hmm. Well, the you know D A I M O N literally just means divine spirit. And hmm. back in ancient Greek culture, that you were constantly consulting your demons, uh, you know, to have a good crop, to learn when to have sex with your wife, to have a kid, to learn how to win the battle to all that stuff. Everything was a constant. When I brought up the, the reason why I brought up the coding thing is because they use Damon. Yeah. Use Damon program. That's got to do this particular thing, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, and, and, and uh, learning Linux much later, you know, I, I saw that word demon D A E M O N. And that's literally just a lifeless program. It looks like a person. But it's not. It's a literal NPC, you know, a non-player yeah, yeah. character. It, yeah. It's it's a phantom that runs runs a task, um, and you just do the math. You know, you just do the math and say, well, I know demons are real. I, I know ethereal stuff is real. I know that we have this culture that now shames and and talks bad about demons, like that they are the source of evil. But everything I read, it's actually more like people are the source of evil that are kind of like pushing these demons to do really bad shit because it's a constant, um, I just, I just started adding up all the things I could read about demons. And that's when Jerry Marzinski's work came on my desk. And that guy was just incredible. Yeah. I don't know that. Don't Jerry know. Marzinski, uh, used to work in a prison. He's a, got a master's in clinical psychology and, uh, he, he just started documenting like hundreds and hundreds of cases of paranoid schizophrenics mm. and, uh, crystal meth addicts. Um, anyone that was basically either going to be in a prison or a mental ward, Jerry had access to. What's his last name again? Marzinski, M-A-R-Z-I-N-S-K-A-Y. Um, he, he does interviews too on, on YouTube, so you should be able to find some good stuff on him. Uh, just really brilliant guy, like really, really open with his data. Not, not really assuming, you know, just, just wants you to just have all the data. And, uh, uh, incidentally, and, it, and that's one of the reasons why I was looking forward to this call. Uh, I was I listened to a lot of audio, so I have uh, the the it was a mix. It was the uh, Kybalion and uh, um, anyway, this one note because they're short articles and they put them all together, you know. So this one I forgot its name, but it started talking about demons and evoking demons and how you do it. You know, not that I'm interested in doing that, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I'm like, this is fascinating. And there was a huge caveat at the beginning and at the end. And I guess Proust, uh, some guy named Proust was found dead with a knife in his back after having successfully evoked a demon, you know, months prior. And mm -hmm. what they were telling, the, what the hermeticists were telling us is that when you do this, it's a constant battle of wits. Because the agreement to bring the demon in is, hey, you will serve me now, mm -hmm. and then when I die, I'll serve you, kind of thing. And I'm like, that's why is that a good trade-off? Who would, who in the right mind would want to do that deal, you know? And so um, I, I just found it fascinating because I just finished your book, and then happened to listen to that hours later. And then um, when it comes to meth, my kid, unfortunately, he's 20. Uh, he spent a month in jail, county jail here, uh, for intent to sell. He was leading a double life. He wasn't telling me anything about it. Uh, I noticed some behavioral changes, but I am illiterate when it comes to the drug world. Mm -hmm. And now I know what it looks like because he got super conversational and talkative. Um, and since then, he's told me some things like uh, when they were sitting around smoking meth, uh, it's quite common for these addicts to see faces in the smoke. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of that? Not that. I've heard of the dark figures, though. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that's if that's what what he's seeing too. There's a lot of dark figures that are there. Because it seems it seems to me like anything else in this world, when you start to unveil or uncover some things, there's intent behind pretty much everything in our life, mm -hmm. right? And it's the controllers, it's the cabal, it's uh, whatever, you know, whatever name you want to give them who have, you know, I know they invented meth. Who else is going to do that? Mm -hmm. And with that, there's some sort of will and intent behind it. So I can very easily see a demon being attached to that thing, that act. You know? mm -hmm. 
I mean, continue. I'm sorry. No, I was, I was thinking you were going to give me more detail on what he saw because, uh, the Marzinski says, um, it's pretty amazing because he, um, <clears throat> two meth dealers, two meth heads will actually share the same vision. They, they will yeah. actually see the same dark figure. Um, and, and he was adding up stories across the board where like hundreds of prisoners were seeing the same demon in jail, um, mm. but in different wings and, and each of them was possessed in different ways. And typically it would, typically it would find your strongest, uh, body that it could possess and enable that body, like help that body out so that it becomes, uh, it sets up a chain of command. And then that guy's able to establish a, a hierarchy uh, below him. And then the demon's able to feed off the prana of everyone, you know, on down the line. Um, I'm not saying Marzinski said this, that this is kind of a mix of a lot of different things yeah. that I've read, but uh, um, it was just an interesting kind of corollary. The, these dark figures, uh, the more, either the more they did math or the more someone was paranoid schizophrenic, the more details they were able to see in these dark figures, it got so bad to where they were, they could see their eyes and the eyes were either red or green. Yeah. And I think that's interesting because where I grew up, we, we have a ton of civil war history um, here. And there was always a story of a dark shadow with green eyes that was wandering around uh, the battlefield. Yeah. I just always well, thought. And, and all these battlefield things are, are blood rituals. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I could see a lot of things being evoked and the power being given to those things to produce whatever it is that the higher ups, you know, are wanting to achieve. Yeah. Now, now what's in, so this is really what got me on the program part because, so I'm going to tell you kind of what I can remember out of my book, but everything compiled says demon, and I get so much pushback for this, but I'm just telling you what I know. <laughs> oh, demons, yeah. I demons me. can't lie. Okay. They like actually, that. they can't, but in fact, I'm going to stop and just talk about that because sure, the reason why they can't lie is the exact same reason why uh, an AIM chatbot or a Twitter chatbot can't have a complex conversation with you on Twitter. They can like your post, right? They can repost your post. They could take a response that someone else gave to a similar post and feed that to you. And all three of those things would make you think that you're talking to a living entity. Yeah. But it's the demon fulfilling. It's the demon wants your attention. He, he's right. desperate for your prana, for your life force. I don't think demons are evil. I think demons are, are enslaved. And because they're enslaved, Pain makes anyone selfish. The, the best person in the world will turn selfish when they're in pain. They will, they will do anything they can to survive that. And it's because of that that I, that I see demons as, and by the way, demons are always associated with a pit. The demon's worst fear is always returning to the pit. And if you look back at computer technology, what happens when the daemon finishes its tasks? It's destroyed. It, or the it, name in itself is destroyed. Yeah, it, you know, a, a running cron job, uh, you know, yeah. cron and yeah. computer. You yeah, in Linux, yeah. So the running cron job, once it's done, it's, it's done. Like that demon is dead. It's no longer getting any life force at all from anybody. And so when the cron job runs again, is the demon evoked again, or is it a separate demon? So it's Dang. always a separate demon. It's always been reborn. At least that's how I invoke mine. I, I'm a Pearl guy. I, I just write a lot of Pearl. And so most of my work is involving with Cron. And I'm constantly okay. writing these web spiders that are doing like, you know, let's hit eBay and collect every auction title, you know, so we can, you know, mine some data out of that and figure out, you know, what are Beanie Babies selling for, that kind of stuff. So technically that's 40,000 demons, you know, that are evoked every hour. And each of those, wow. each yeah. of those demons is destroyed after it's done, you know, so that task might take it, you know, three seconds. That, is that an efficient, is that an efficiency thing to destroy the demon or? Yeah. yeah. Cause you don't want, if you give it to one task, the second that eBay runs slow for that one guy, you're now bottlenecked and you're waiting for that task. But if you can create an army of demons and you invoke them over and over, you know, and you thread, you know, you have to thread it. So you're not just having one demon. You've got 12 demons. Right. And those 12 demons are invoking 12 other demons on your behalf. 
and those 12 are invoking 12 more. That's how I would normally run a spider. Yeah. And that way I can just walk up to a, a mother that's laying eggs, you know, demon eggs and either kill her or, you know, start her up. It just depends. So, um, but what you end up with is all this, like a demon really wants to serve people. And I actually don't know of any demon that says, I will do this if you, when you die, come serve me. I, I, I personally think that's a projection that that guy's putting on, on them, you know, like that's what has to happen. The, the way I see it is, is that that demon will literally just, just wants you. He just wants your attention. He wants you, it, the longer that he's out of the pit, the, the less he's enslaved. The, the, it's just, a, it's just a. Yeah, if he's, if he's put to task, then he's out of the pit. He's when a he's not yeah, to task, cessation. He goes back to the pit. Yeah. So it's a cessation of asphyxiation in a sense. Like if you know, I, I don't know what it's like, but I would um, imagine this you, pit is like really shitty. Which I imagine yeah. like being in a situation where you could never breathe, where you could never see, where you you know you're just in a constant. So are you are yeah. you familiar? Are you familiar with the uh, the Christian Greek scriptures when it talks about Tartarus? Mm -mm. You should write that word down, Tartarus. It's, yeah, well, I know that word, but yeah, but tell me, tell me what. Really, to Tartary, which is another, mm -hmm. you know, why did they conceal from history Tartary? You know, mm -hmm. I, and I did a little look into it. It is related, and it could have simply come from uh, battles with the, the Tartars and looking at them as the enemy construct, and then saying, you know what, Tartary is a a pit, a dense darkness. So in Greek, in Greek, it would be Tartarus. And that's all it means. The, if you look it up in a Christian dictionary, it says a pit of dense darkness. And that's the only wow. reason why I brought that term. That's up to awesome. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. That's it, it just sheds more, more light, you know, really into it. And, you know, going back to the ancient, what it used to mean, that's why I don't think demons are evil. I, I, I think uh, demons and it, does, and it does say, it does say that uh, God cast them into mm -hmm. Tartarus. Yeah. Yeah. And everything here should be God, yeah. which means that all the evil needs to belong to God, which is why I've changed my thinking about what cosmology is and particularly theism. I don't, I don't subscribe to theism anymore. And, and I see that, uh, that system as well, evil isn't, isn't a living entity. It's a, it's a vacuum. It's that pit of Tartarus, but inside of everyone. And the, you know, the more you become satanic, satanic doesn't mean, ah, it doesn't want, no, you know, the I'm, more you become I'm, empty, the more you yeah. evacuate to a chain of command, that's the key. Because like if you're a soldier, you're going to shoot someone and you're just going to say, oh, it's part of the job. Like, like, Interesting that you said vacuum. Um, there is another scripture that talks about a house swept clean. So in other words, there's a demon activity in the house. You sweep it clean, and it's making an analogy to the mind as well. In, in the scripture itself, it's correlating to mind. And it says, a, an empty mind is a vacuous one where a demon can come back into. So you must clean and then replace something in the house, in the mind, and then a demon cannot, cannot enter. Hmm. So I found that, yeah. I'll look it up before we you know, end the call. Oops. Excuse me. Let me turn that phone off there. Anyway, uh, yeah, so Tartarus, dense pit. Um, the word God, uh, I don't use God anymore. Um, I don't know if you know Seven Bomar. Uh -uh. James Evan Bomar. Uh, it's a black gentleman who's uh, got something online called the Inner um, University, but it's Interversity. And uh, he's the first one that stated that God is a Germanic word that comes from goat. So the word good and goat and God are all related. Hmm. And so, uh, and it's not a word that was uh, ancient really. So there's a, a, a problem with translation early on where if something is talking about Greek theos, incidentally, theos has been placed into um, all of English language, because if we say the cat, we're evoking through words, theos, cat. Wow. So 
E-H-E is just a shortened version of Theos. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at Spanish, L, which is Saturn, right? Yeah, yeah. Wow. La and L. As long as the letter L is in there, you've got an e evocation. Interesting. It doesn't, matter what, it doesn't matter what the vowels are because just like Hebrew, right? Uh, you got the tetragrammaton, mm -hmm. you know, you're it right to left, and it's uh, Y H V H. Yehovah, you have to put the vowels in there. Well, was it pronounced Yehovah? Mm -hmm. And then we anglicize it, and it becomes Jehovah. Mm -hmm. But you know, and then um, the point being, though, in all the Romantic languages, especially French and Italian and Spanish, because they have to constantly use the word L or La. Mm -hmm. Now. Whereas in English, we can kind of get away with it on a few occasions, but yeah. And that's no one, fascinating. Well, um, that's uh, the, like Aaron and the whole group that you met, you know, they typically will ask me what, uh, you know, hey, what does this word mean? And if I don't know it, I'll go look it up. I'll spend some time on it. But um, I've got several books on the alphabet. <laughs> My latest one is Mysteries of the Alphabet. And uh, it's, it's awesome. But absidarian, I guess, is what they call me. Um, I guess that's the word. That's where we get the word abracadabra from. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, Abraxas is a demon's name, which comes from abracadabra. Yeah. So, you know, me, that, uh, that's what I've been focusing on for the past two years. I really want to know what every glyph and sigil and <laughs> because – we just think in terms of, uh, oh, you go to grade school and they go, hey, here's the alphabet. Mm -hmm. No child ever asks, where did the alphabet come from? Mm -hmm. Who invented it? Why is it there? Um, you know, you would just go straight into it, mm -hmm. straight into the words. And then they're not taught the appropriate words. And the, their vocabulary is limited nowadays, especially. Yeah. Uh, if you've spent any uh, time doing any marketing on on your blogs or stuff like that like you know looking into it like how do I get more people to read uh -huh. my stuff they always tell you the same thing write for a sixth grader uh -huh. and it's, it's a kind of a, a sad thing I understand simplicity but words especially the ones we seem to be casting away you know um, that's why I like Neil Kramer too he'll always resurrect an old word like supernal you know, mm -hmm. and uh, the, our little group kind of got carried away with it. It's like supernal truth, supernal discussion group, supernal, <laughs> you know, but it's a good word. And these words should be, you know, used. But anyway, I digress. We were. No, you're not digressing. That's that's really interesting. I, I just uh, I wrote a, a chapter called the Babel virus in that book. And uh, it it explains how language it just, you know, what if language is a virus? And there's a, there's a, a voodoo ritual where the high priest, um, it's called gumbo. Now this gumbo is typically uh, a black child if you're wealthy or a black dog if you can't afford it. Hurry. You, so you're going you're gonna to sacrifice something here, huh? The, the, the gumbo is, is, is made and, and it's eaten by the priest and the priest uh, – vomits it up and all the followers eat that vomit and what's really fascinating about this is this is like the darkest form of possession that is available according to voodoo priests and what's really fascinating is if you look what happens in education a child goes into the classroom the high priest vomits um what they were fed the 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 black dog the, the language that they were fed and everyone else becomes possessed if they eat. But by them eating it, um, they are basically becoming possessed by language. Yep. And so it really ties in exactly with what you're saying about the theos and the the and the la and the la. You know, it's, it's really fascinating stuff. And it's something that I keep noticing, even as a writer, I'm like, words suck, man. Like, like, <laughs> like they really do because I, I'm never able to – to emote with people. And when, when I have a internet connection, you and I can't really emote. We sort of can, but we, we really can't. We, we can really only communicate with gestures yeah. and 
speaking. You can't feel me in the room. You can't feel my energy change. You know, right. you can't feel my, my temperature raise when you say something or it lower. You, you're, you're unable to see all that stuff. And it gets worse with chat. Yeah, it, and, and so that's why Same, it's yeah. such a beautifully genius invention for the demons to develop this onk screen scrying device where we may only communicate using the possession of the language that we were taught from a very young age. So it's keeping us imprisoned, um, you know, even longer. It's making us uh, more of a sacrifice to that machine. And yeah. as long as we have it in our head, there's no way to get it out. When I'm writing, if, if my neighbor's home and they turn on the radio on their porch, I'm not able to write because the radio has words in it. Words are now coming through the radio at me as I'm trying to write. So yep. it'll be a commercial for a car. Then it'll go into a song talking about how codependency is the greatest thing ever. And you should totally, you know, suffer if you're going to really call it true love. And then another car commercial. And then, you know, I need to buy an energy drink. The entire time I am being raped in a way I'm being assaulted by uh, chemicals. It not actually chemicals because each word invokes a chemical inside my head. And those chemicals are combined in such a way where, you know, they can escalate me or they can de-escalate me. Have know? they, um, have they mapped those? Uh, I don't think that we've been able to map any chemicals. In fact, if you look at paranoid schizophrenia, we're walking around telling everybody it's a chemical imbalance and there's yeah. not one, there's not one test ever, ever, in any lab that's ever been able to isolate either the chemical that's missing yeah, it's or a, the it's it's too a, much of in the brain. It's total it's bullshit. Like all in ca encapsulating term. Um, yeah. My brother has a problem. He's in my older brother. Uh, he's perpetually 15. Mm -hmm. He's not grown emotionally past that and very, very quick to anger. Yeah. And uh, never got a proper diagnosis, but he's on Social Security income, so when every time – Two years comes around, they test him again. Yep, sure. Here, take your money. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, so, uh, some doctor said he might be have a mild form of schizophrenia. You know. Yeah. And when he was going through puberty, um, I remember him checked out on the couch. I was uh, like eleven years old. That made him fourteen. And then, out of nowhere, after hours of silence, sitting in the couch, staring out the window. He turns to us and goes, did I kill somebody? And we're like, what? Yes, down the street. Did I kill somebody down the street? No, you didn't. Mm -hmm. You know? And uh, that was their first clue that this is a freaky thing. So we haven't ever been able to get him any kind of help. He's just kind of on his own. Well, let's talk about that because um, – like chemical, chemical imbalance was slung around like crazy. Yeah, and, and not once can they tell you the chemical. They can't name it. They can't point to a study. It's total bullshit. It's an excuse to give you pharmaceuticals. That's yeah. all it is. It's just an excuse to do that. Luckily, he's drug-free. Um, he doesn't do anything. In fact, uh, he's kind of a – envisions himself as a vigilante. He got kicked out of a um, – in San Jose, <laughs> he was in a building specifically for those who are having a hard time mentally. Mm -hmm. He's the only one on record that's ever been kicked out because he was convinced that people were drinking meth. He heard one article about smuggling meth in Gatorade containers. And from that point on, he was thought for sure that they were all meth addicts mm -hmm. drinking meth. And I mean, like, well, if you do that, you'll die. So they weren't drinking meth. It, you, you got your story wrong. But anyway, he well, paranoid. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. He was paranoid. Yeah, go for it. Well, th that paranoia, it, it, in my opinion, it is a form of possession. And th that's, the, the, that's the initial stages of a possession. And let's go back to the pit. If, if you're a demon and you don't want to be in a pit, you're looking to serve someone in a long capacity. You, you want to stay out of the pit. That's your only goal. So yes. that's why you're going to kiss ass. That's why demons kiss ass. I mean, they, they really want to help you. Um, but it's not like they're looking out for your well-being. They're, they're selfish. They're in pain. They're only looking after their own. So if they can find a victim that they can pry themselves inside of, they then can escape the pit because now they're living inside of you. And I, I, I think that, that as we start to uncover what possession really means, 
uh, that we'll all we'll start to see that this is literally all that's happening. It really is just as simple. And, and it's, it's because we have weak egos. Um, I don't know if this made it in the book, but I covered about 12 stories that really stuck out at me that were all, quote, quote, I'm using quotes here, but bear with yeah. me, targeted individuals, okay? Yeah. These mm-hmm. are people that say they're targeted. Some of no, them you, have, you did you, the targeted individuals made it into your book, yeah. Okay, so they definitely are, are. You know, some of them are definitely targeted. I mean, without a doubt, some of them, I think, actually are possessed by demons, and and they're blaming it on the state. Sometimes they're blaming things on on the demons that are actually the state. I mean, it's a little it's a little bit of, it's a potpourri there. What's going on? But every one of them happens the same way. It's always an attack on the ego first. And once that ego goes, that's when they start to get paranoid. That because their their gas, it's no different than when you're driving a car and the it's flashing that you're running out of gas. You are not in the same state of mind in your endocrine system when you're when you're almost out of gas. You are in a state of, am I gonna make it? Am I gonna make it? Am I gonna? and yeah. if anyone was to say, Hey, can you stop here? This no, what are you kidding? No, you know, it's it's <laughs> yeah, you are possessed. That's by true. the desperation, you know, of exactly. what's to happen. And because of the way we shame ego and culture, mm-hmm. it's actually done on purpose because it's, it's allowing more possessions to happen. And that's why drugs, the reason why drugs always precede a possession. One, one guy in particular, he, really healthy guy, he was at a party, he did a bunch of, of acid too much. He fell on the floor. All these people like looked over him. And I, in my opinion, his ego just melted. Like he just, he, his outer shell melted. But what's happening is he's melted and there's now 16 people that are over him that are all drunk, which means that they've allowed the alcohol demon into their system. Aren't you there? Yeah. Al- yeah. Al- yeah. I, tell, I, I tell people that and they're like, uh, it's become a little bit of a joke. Uh, uh, but uh, I tell people, hey, you, do you know Batman? Batman's nemesis is Ra's al Ghul. It's an Arabic word, and it comes from the demon's head, hmm. the head of the demon, you know? And so, uh, and there's many, many um, tales of people being in a bar where they're not drunk. Maybe they've had one drink, but they look over at the bar at this guy, and they look up, and there is a blacker than shadow, blacker than black entity mm-hmm. with sparkling little lights in it, looking down at the guy, and as soon as he has that next scotch, there's a, a, a window of, oops, mm-hmm. you're frozen, but am I still connected? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So um, there's a sweet spot where that portal just seems to open up after the next drink, and he just descends right into the guy, and the guy starts acting like an asshole. Mm-hmm. He starts trying to pick a fight to the guy next to him, and I, I'm like, this is absolutely fascinating. Yeah. You know, wow. so anything that is going to adjust the consciousness, whether it's LSD or psilocybin or DMT or mm-hmm. meth or how about Coca-Cola? Mm-hmm. Excessive sugar, you know, I mean. Well, all those are forms of shock. The body experiences all those as forms of shock. And when you enter shock, your immune system shuts down parts of, you know, there's like 32 pieces of your immune system, but like maybe six of them shut down when you go into shock because why waste that energy? Like you're, you're in shock right now. I'm not going to worry about whether or not you have a virus in your nose, you know? So the same thing is probably happening to your energetic immune system where the alcohol, the mescaline, the LSD, the acid, whatever it is, is causing that same shock to the system. And that's where something is allowed to insert itself and get inside. And the reason why, maybe, maybe, the reason why so many uh, drunks are angry drunks is because the endocrine system, when you get angry, is producing a lot more adrenaline. And that adrenaline is probably drinkable uh, by, you know, by oh, these yeah. forces. And so th- they're literally trying to save their life by jacking into your adrenaline system and, and, you know, drinking from the straw, so to speak. So um, is this the same phenomenon known as louche or? Um, I don't know. I know that word, but I, I, I don't know. So, I have more to learn on it, you know. I, I'm so thinking about that. So there's Vril mm-hmm. 
and there's louche. And evidently, it seems to be that those are synonymous, just different terms for the same thing. But it, angst, fear, energy. And when I've asked several people that seem to know something about this type of stuff, they'll say, yes, it exists. And there are entities that are feeding off of it. Now, of course, our buddy, um, why am I drawing a blank his name? David Icke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> David Icke is, uh, I think he, I don't think he uses the term Vril or Lush. He just says that they feed off your fear and he chooses your reptilians. You know? Yeah. That's what I've been trying to reconcile all of this is like Dijin, mm -hmm. all these different names, Demon, you know, um, Archon. Mm -hmm. Are they all the same thing, or do we need to categorize them into different mm. hierarchical structures? You yeah. know, just so. Well, we, we uh, like the Abrahamic religions all have jinn in some way. You know, it's either going to be the devil or, or uh, you know, a regular class demon or whatever. Um, it, I, I try and just dismiss all that and just look purely at the endocrine system because we're pretend we're personifying a demon. We're personifying the daemon right now. We're, we're right. calling the daemon something alive and right. that's what we want to do. In fact, if we do that, we're actually feeding it. Give, give it more power. We're giving it life force. Yeah. That one of the reasons why the quote, quote devil is so powerful is because everyone's walking around saying the devil exists. You know, everyone's saying, no, it's a creature. It's this, red guy you know and you're licking his asshole and all that stuff like it, it's in, and i understand why we like to anthropomorphize stuff i get that but we're literally so, pouring our so, prana into that entity would be uh, a synonymous word possibly egregor uh, egg, oh yeah egg. yeah yeah so it's a um, like for instance uh, a company comes about uh, let's just starbucks starbucks has an egregor mm -hmm. right and it's there's a cult following. Uh, I, I don't drink anywhere except Starbucks. You right, know? Right, right. Or Apple Computer is a big one mm -hmm. where they get triggered because you mentioned the word PC or Linux. Mm -hmm. you know? um, it's like, wow, there's more. It can't be human. Yeah. And what's happening there? Possession, right? Well, what's happening there is that you're putting all of your, because you believe in Starbucks, because you believe in Trump, because you believe in Jesus, you were pouring your life force into that archetype. It, it's paying you back. I, the transaction is going to depend on who it is yeah. and how well you, you know, sometimes you might get a net, you know, green, you might be profitable. It might be a loss. It, it, it's kind of off the subject. The point is, is that you're putting your life force into that archetype. And the second somebody comes around and threatens that in any way, they have a chance to lose that entire pot. Like in poker, you know, yeah. all those prana chips are pushed into the, into the pot. Okay. Prana you know, chips. <laughs> and and like you're that. literally, you know, yeah. you're, you're gambling yeah. that Starbucks is real. You're gambling that Apple is the best thing. And so anyone that comes in the room that disrupts that is, is really fucking with your prana economy. Like your entire life force has a budget and they just take in the value of the dollar and cut it in half, you know. Oh, yeah. Whereas if someone else comes in, you know, they, they, might, they might triple the value. And so that's why I keep telling people that we need to just look – we don't need to be listening to anybody's words right now. Like seriously, all we have to do is watch the psychology that's behind the words that they're saying. Because if you can just track that psychology, you can really get a better picture of the ebb and flow of prana as you know, what's coming in. And that's why you'll find someone that gets really, really threatened. Uh, my mom loves Oprah Winfrey. It, it, the moment that I've tried to tell her about Oprah, like it's just, I mean, it's just completely shut down. And, and think about it. This is a woman that's known me my entire life. You know, my mom's known me my entire life. And she has more loyalty to, to Oprah. Oprah Winfrey. She's never been in the room with her. She's never yeah. met her in person. But she has more loyal. She has more faith in Oprah than in me. Now, when this used to happen years ago, I would take that personally. personally. I would yeah. be offended by it. It was a reflection of my self-worth. Yeah. Why am I not smart enough? But now I'm able to see through that psychology and say, James, she's watched Oprah every day at four o'clock for the last 10 years. Yeah. You were literally fucking with all of that energy. 
like, you know, every single bit of that energy, you're, you're coming in after the fact and saying, yeah, this great skyscraper you built, uh, floors six through 14 have to go. Sorry. You know, uh, mm. what else are you going to do, but freak out? You're going to get defensive about that. You're going to tell if it's your own son, you're going to be like, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, yeah. it's just stop. And that's, that's why I keep, I keep pushing us back away from our words and just looking at the underlying, because my mom is going to tell you whatever it takes, whatever it takes for her to say on Tuesday to get you to leave Oprah alone. That's what the words will come. It's yeah. not going to be, she's not going to go home and think about it and say, you know, I've really evaluated this archetype or I've really evaluated the sigil and, you know, and, and I agree with you and I'm going to be switching my prana from this over to that. I mean, it is possible. You know, it is. I've done that. And I know my mom has too. But the point is, is that that's not the standard reaction. You know, the first reaction is, how dare you? What, what are you talking about? That's why we, in America, we've got the two-party system. It's exactly why. Because once you can establish that, really what you're doing is you're watching two people fight over their pot of prana. You know, they're literally saying, no, my Obama chips are good. And the other side saying, dude, those Obama chips are bad. Every one of those Obama chips is, is fucking evil. You know, yeah. the same way with Trump, the same way with everything else. That's why we're never going to win in a system where we are giving our energy to the archetype that's been specified for us. You know, w once that vessel's been set up, once that daemon, right, has been set up, if we feed that daemon, remember that I was telling earlier where you've got a, you've got a daemon, but then you have a mother that gives birth to it oh. and kills it? In the computers is now is that also a analogous to something else that's happening in what we would say are existence? So, so let's say that 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 Bob loves Obama. Okay. Bob now gives his life force to a daemon inside of him, inside of him, that's for Obama. And he collects that prana and takes it to who? The person that created the daemon. Not him, not Obama, the person that created that daemon. Now, this is probably going to be another daemon, you know, a, da a daemon up higher than that. But the point is, is that it's a satanic chain of command where all that prana comes up to the top. And that's why you have thoroughbred altars. Um, the Vanderbilts are thoroughbred altars. The Clintons are thoroughbred altars. These are thoroughbred horses yeah. that are living in a human body. They don't have free will. You know, the, the person that wins the Kentucky Derby, that horse doesn't get to go out and just play all day. You know, right. it, it has a very strict schedule. You know, they, they wax its butthole. I mean, they're shining its, its hooves. I mean, it's a terrible life. It doesn't really have freedom. You look at it and you think, oh, that horse must have the greatest life. But actually, no, that, that horse really has no choice what it does. It's more of a slave than anybody. Yeah. So think about it. If, if you were Black Beauty or whatever and you win the Kentucky Derby, you don't get that prana. Even though everyone is cheering, right? Even though everyone is cheering for you, that horse doesn't get that prana. The owner of that horse gets the prana. He gets all of it. Yeah. And that's what's happening with demons. That's what's happening with all these uh, puppets that are placed out in front. They are prana magnets, but they're not actually the collector. You know, it's the, they bring it in but they don't actually keep it. It's going right. somewhere so, else. Same thing with celebrity, right? So yes, all this exactly. focused attention, and I'm, I'm thinking about Lady Gaga. Yes. I'm buying her music. I'm listening to her music. My thoughts are always going to Lady Gaga. Yeah. So she's receiving all that, and she doesn't get to keep all that energy from me, and there's millions of us doing it, mm -hmm. so it's got to get channeled up through her and into whoever set her up. Yes. Now, she's going to get some, to be fair, but this is why elite stars, you'll notice they have these grueling, ridiculously painful tour schedules. Like even Bob Dylan. I mean, the, the dude is a, a dust bag and he's still playing, you know, four or five yeah. times a week. It's, it's, think about it. If you had multi, you wouldn't do that. Well, like you, I, I, I've been a musician on the road. It's fucking hard. Like it, 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 you don't have that kind of energy all the time, but they're doing it because they're thoroughbreds. They're, they're literally been trained to do that. And, and because they're getting a little bit of that prana, they're still getting fed. So they still have a reason to want to do that, but they don't actually have the free will. They can't even control their own endocrine system to go, Hey, I'd rather not get fed this way. I'd rather find a way to get fed a different way. The exact same way I can't find a normal woman that would, that I would like who, who is attached to me. 
I, I'm only going to be attracted to a woman that's detached from me. That's the only way I can get fed in my endocrine system on that deep level that makes me feel alive, you know, that makes like, I want this lollipop. You're right. I want the butterscotch lollipop more than any, anything else you can offer me. If it, if it's not butterscotch, it's, I'm just, it's just not going to be a, the same, you know, that's why we're all, that's why everyone's an asset. The entire world's an asset, but none of us are like undercover agents. Like all of us are just, we have our desires. We've been tuned into those desires and this is what's going to make us, you know, it's going to make us move. And yeah. it's going to be something that you could control through a demon, through, you know, a psyop, through a spell. And that's probably really all a spell is, is just like in Linux, you would invoke a demon. In spellcraft, you would invoke a demon. You would send it out on your way. Your will your willpower is a living prana entity that you can assign it a surface tension, you know, oh, and that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Leave and go perform a task and come back. This happens all the time. Uh, a mother will be like, where's my child? Where's my child? And something about her knows, like she, she knows, you know, he's safe. I'm going to kill him, but he's safe, you know, or he, he's dead. Like something's really bad happened, you know, it's, it's, they're going to know that because they're, in my opinion, they're invoking that demon they're mm -hmm. saying, go find my child right now. And that demon's going out and doing it, it because why it wants your attention. It doesn't want her to throw that demon out. It, we're possessed anyway. We, we've been possessed since we we're kindergarten. You know, we're, yeah. we are full of demons that when we're circumcised demons enter us, when we drink. Yeah. You know, and that's, and that's the thing too. I was just having a conversation um, about that with some, uh, bandmates yesterday about the trauma created through that. And there's the only uh, thing about circumcision that anyone has ever tried to come up with why it's a good thing to do is cleanliness. And it's like, well, we're born naturally that way. So it takes somebody to teach us how to be cleanly. Like a, a woman is taught how to be cleanly. Mm -hmm. This is how you take care of your genitalia, mm -hmm. you know? So why is it necessary? Why, why cut, because it's a ritual, mm -hmm. because it, it, it's trauma and it causes something in the man to be less than himself and it will take him time to figure out what that is. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Plus your, your entire energy body will run away from the wound and the furthest spot you can get away from the end of your penis is up in your head. And if we can convince all of us that we are just heads in jars, which is something you see on TV all the time. Constantly, yeah. That's that's why they look at look at us right now, Jonathan. Right now, you no, and I we're are heads in yeah. a box. There you, you know? go, head in a box. It's in boxes right now. This is exactly what they want. This is exactly how how it will happen. You know, that's why Walt Disney quote quote had his head frozen. Yeah, right? that's why Futurama has all their heads. For, this this is programming to get you to yeah. think you're just in your head, and when you're in your head. You don't have the same power to your soccer kick or your throwing arm. You're, you know, your all your strength is up in your head. You, this is why ascension programs are so popular too. This is yeah. why people are always saying, "Yeah, you gotta, you gotta leave your corporeal prison," you know. And I'm always like, "What the fuck are you talking about? Like the body's like the most amazing thing in the world. Like you, we want to immerse in our body. We don't want to ascend. We want to immerse. We want to go deeper into our body. And that's when your egoic force field shows up." That's when you find truth inside yourself, you know, because it's resonating, like your bones are resonating when you hear truth. And, and it, it, follows the, uh, it follows the hermetic principle, as within, so without, as above, mm -hmm. so below. Yeah. And it's your only God of your body, you know. You're a complete sovereign of your body. Your, your pelvis. And that's the thing, too. The, the, uh, the, the program running to hate yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, you are human. Therefore, you are corrupt and you should die. Yeah, you're born into sin. Yeah, and so Greenpeace, you'll have someone who will murder men to save a whale mm -hmm. or murder men who are attempting to kill a baby seal. Mm -hmm. uh, there are stories of people watching the news and being so affected by it that humans need to die. So I'm going to kill myself and give all my money in my will to the SPCA. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, well, a lot of those species, if mankind's not around, those species will die because they need man to live <laughs> like mm -hmm. a, like a chihuahua. I don't know if it could go out and get food for itself, but. Yeah. And life and death isn't really that important to the prana economy. 
Like, it, same with love and hate. Like, if you love Donald Trump and if you hate Donald Trump, you're still giving him exactly the same prana. You're, it, it, there's no, and it, people have argued with me, say, no, no, if you love, if you love Trump, you'll be fed by it. And it, no, actually, you won't. It, if you yeah, had a I, personal I, relationship, I, yeah. if you did, if you had a personal relationship with him, you would be fed by it because you're giving and he's giving, you know, that, that's a feeding, that's a mutual symbiotic relationship. But when we have an archetype, an archon, you know, that's, that happens to be run by a human because, you know, a cross could be an, a, a sigil, but so could a living human. Yeah. Just like all that prana is going to go into that. It's, it's in fact, the only prana you're getting back from giving to the cross is the idea that, well, if you're meek and if you sacrifice yourself, you are redeemed. So in a way, you're sucking more prana from yourself, but you're under the impression that it's coming back to you through the right. cross. It's almost like a, an investment, right? Like an yeah. investment. And I would say that the quality and even the quantity doesn't matter that it's going to Trump, let's say, or mm-hmm. Oprah. They're still receiving it, and you're just giving it off for free. Yes, yeah, I would say so. Now, Can, now that prana is going to be cheaper if everyone else likes like likes Trump. For example, if I was to like the band Blink One Eighty Two, I think that's the band. It's yeah, the one band right. that just gets yeah. so trashed all the time. You know, just like <laughs> everyone's like, "Oh, that band sucks," and, and I'm, I, I don't care. I, my point is, is that if I like a band that everyone hates, it's a much more expensive prana yeah, yeah, yeah. for yeah, me makes sense. Yeah. but if but if i like something that everyone else likes my prana is worth you know five times the value of had it would have been if blink 182 is there supply yeah. demand but it also pays off because yeah. if if i am backing donald trump before he won the election and people know that they see me pouring my prana out i'm automatically going to get a bump if he ends up winning like I'm going to have more prana than everyone else because I had more chips in earlier and yeah. everyone's just going to naturally give me prana. This happens with Scott Adams. He's a, a you know, comedian kind of writer. Like he's one of the first person that said Trump's going to win. His, his fame really went up because of that because once Trump won, he was considered, Oh, he's an expert. Now that's, those are the words, Jonathan, but look yeah. at the prana underneath. See yeah. what was happening underneath. He was yeah. throwing chips into a pot that had a, you know, one to 3,000 odds, and, and it came through. And, and everyone has to pay him out with that. You can't look at Scott Adams and say, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. You actually have to say, this guy's a visionary. He saw things before anyone else would. But what's happening underneath is you're giving him your prana, whether you want it or not. You don't really have a choice. Like, you can hate Scott Adams, and this is how it's funny. The prana economy works this way, because if you hated Scott Adams, you put in those chips into the pile of I hate Scott Adams, and then he ends up winning, right? Because he predicted Trump. All those chips you put in are gone. Not only that, but you're going to feel like shit. Every time you see Scott Adams, you're going to be paying him more prana because you see how successful he is now. Yet yeah. you're the one that put in all those chips. So that's what I mean by the prana economy. It's a constant economy and there's nothing you can do about it. Like it's, it's what you believe is where you're putting your chips in. And that investment's either going to pay off dividends or it's going to suck dividends out of you. Reminds me of those people that say, I don't care if people talk bad about me or good about me just as long as they talk about me. Yeah. But th- that attitude is tapping into something that that's, they may unconsciously not a, know exists. Yeah. That thing product, marketing. Uh, yeah. There's no good press or, you know, the good press and bad press or, or press, you know, or, yes. you know what I mean? There's another expression yeah. like that. Yeah. Exact yeah. same thing. All of our press, all of our marketing, marketing really is magic. It's just all sigil work. And uh, Michael Tassarian and, yeah, more, more him. Mark Paseo does, or Paseo, I should say, does a little bit of that too. But Michael Tassarian uh, did several four-hour videos on the subject of marketing and sigils and, mm-hmm. and those type of things, you know. And what's funny is if you try to bring it up to someone who's not even – slightly mindful of it it's like you are nuts what do you yeah. coca-cola doesn't affect me look at their logo it doesn't affect me it's like because it's all unconscious and it's designed that way mm-hmm. yeah. that's why i keep saying you really have to just ignore the words it the, the words really don't tell you much it, if you watch the psychology if you watch someone's twitch if you say trump 
you're going to learn a lot more about them than if you hear them say, yeah, Trump's okay. Like, you know, they might just be saying that because they're under the impression that there's a bunch of Trump people around. So, yeah. you know, the energy, the prana is not deceptive. Like if once you learn how to see it, I, I don't think there's really a way to hide that. I don't think there's a way to stop it. That's why all the black magicians that are so successful are always using the same system. This is yeah. just how it works. You know, it's just, no, if you want water, you're going to have to have something to carry it. It's going to look something sort of like a cup or a bucket and it's going to have a handle, you know, and that's the nature of how it works. And that's yeah. why everything kind of looks like that. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with the work of Tom Campbell? No. Um, Robert Monroe, the uh, Monroe Institute on the East no. Coast. I don't know what they do. So uh, Bob Monroe was an NBC executive who at one point uh, just randomly uh, had an out-of-body experience. Uh, he woke up on the ceiling looking at his chandelier. He thought it was a, a fountain. It's like, why am I seeing a fountain right now? And then he happened to turn around and look. And he saw his body. He's like, oh, my God, I'm dead. Wow. And as soon as he started having that fear, he slammed back into his body. So after that episode, he decided to start – looking into it mm -hmm. and uh, he wanted to approach it from a scientific means so he created the uh, Robert Monroe Institute and he hired a bunch of people I and mean, this is in the 60s and 70s and uh, one of them happened to be a NASA physicist called Tom Campbell mm -hmm. uh, recently Tom Campbell released a book called my big toe or theory of everything and I, uh, I know I know who you're talking about okay yeah yeah, yeah. And uh, he, because he comes from a technical background, he uses metaphors mm -hmm. such as the larger consciousness unit and the individuated consciousness unit. And that's where ego resides and, and that type of thing. Very uh, interesting stuff, but it dovetails into some of this demonology, you know? Um, and uh, he's just a, he's almost like a Santa Claus type guy, you know, mm -hmm. just real gentle doesn't get too controversial, always trying to, he typically stays focused on um, practical means, you know, mm -hmm. what can you do with it? And he used to heal people, he no longer does, because he realized it's a complex system, like for instance, uh, one of his tales was, he uh, healed a guy from cancer, and then um, about a year later, he died at the hands of a doctor who was um, negligent. Mm -hmm. Then he found out the backstory of uh, when this gentleman who died was 22 years old or something like that. He wiped out a family in an auto accident because he was drunk. So he was negligent. Mm -hmm. So Tom heals him from his cancer, but then his life ends anyway on time, probably on a schedule due to um, what he needed to learn. Mm hmm in this particular time frame. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, if you, it's a three volume book, my big toe. So it's a, uh, I, I don't necessarily recommend it unless you have plenty of time, mm -hmm. you know, but it's on, it's an audio. He, he reads it too. So maybe that's a, yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. And um, what was some of the other points? Yeah. That's one thing I wanted to bring up to you is uh have you read Tom Campbell? Um, I also think that a, a good part of demons that is never talked about is, uh, is plant entities. And like, for so example, nature, trees and bushes. And um, yeah. Like for example, your, I think you said it was your brother. I think it was your brother, maybe your cousin. No yeah, brother. The one who doesn't do drugs, but is having problems. Um, I can't believe I'm suggesting this, but I'm under the impression that cannabis really, really helps with demons. Yeah. And only because the cannabis is, is an entity. It's an ally, you know, like Carlos right. Castaneda, it's a plant ally, but yeah. because it's so selfish. Um, it, so, so marijuana is selfish. Yeah. Because, because cannabis is so selfish, you know, candida will, will form a protective shell over you. And that's why when you're stoned, it actually feels like something's grabbing your skull. Oh, interesting. Almost like it's moving you around. Um, uh, you, you really have to have a, like most people that, that smoke cannabis have a monogamous relationship with that plant. 
um, it becomes yeah, a one on one. And to not either mix it or favor another mm -hmm. medicine. Yeah. And I think it's because the candida is, is but, forming yeah. that shell to protect you, but, but it's purely yeah, for I'm selfish sorry. reasons. You know, so you meant cannabis, right? You said candida twice. Yeah, cannabis. Sorry. Um, Unless we, but hey, I love that subject too. How do we get rid of candida? But anyway, um, it, she's trying to form a symbiotic, codependent relationship with you, and because of that, it's able to. She's going to block out everything else that could hurt you. She needs you as healthy as possible to serve her needs. Interesting. And that's why. Um, I think that's actually probably why they, they you know, when alcohol came in um, with prohibition, um, keep in mind that they put the brakes on saying no alcohol for 13 years, and then they let go. And by, yeah. you know, if you were to squeeze 13. someone's neck for yeah, 13, 13 years, yeah. you know that in year 13, they're going to want to breathe. Like that's going to be the first thing they want to do is breathe. And mm -hmm. so when you were, are then making cannabis illegal, I think what you're really doing is, is that they knew that there's a plant ally that would be very protective against the alcohol coming in. And so it needs to be a two pronged approach where we want to possess an entire country of America. So we need to introduce alcohol. First, we need to prohibit it. And then we need to introduce it to get people using it. Then we need to push it with Hollywood. And then we're going to be able to possess, insert our demons in the way. And we can't have cannabis. Uh, getting in the way, trying to protect everybody from that. Th that's a no, no. Yeah. And so um, I, I use that as I'm a layman, you know, don't listen to me, but it might be a good thing because. No, uh, I've, I've thought of that because I've, I've had friends that are, um, were drunks and uh, it, it would sadden me. I'm like, look, dude, I would rather you mm -hmm. smoke marijuana because you're not going to kill your liver. Yeah. You're not going to get sclerosis. So, you know, come on, you know, do something, you yep. know, trade one for the other if you have to. And, uh, yeah, it's, they don't call it spirits for nothing. Yeah. No, they don't. You know, and no one gets the clue on that. Why would that word be applied mm -hmm. to alcoholic beverages? Right. You know, right. Come on, think about it. Yep. The truth is right there. It's, it's always right there. And then when you look at the Arabic root, I'll, I'll go who, you know, mm -hmm. yep. right there. Yep. It says it all. So I, I, you know, I'd love to find more definitive works on that. Mm -hmm. um, but as everything that really matters, it's very difficult to uncover, you know, well, it takes an enormous amount of research. Well, a lot of that you can actually just extrapolate, um, you know, because it, it, so we've already talked about demons and now we're talking about plant allies and I'm not saying they're the same thing but they're definitely both ethereal. They both have an ethereal kind of life force to them, just like we do. And so if you start to look at that ethereal nature of them and you realize, well, wait a minute, on one side, you've got a demon that is inorganic. And then on the other side, you have an organic entity, which shows me, it extrapolates from that, that you don't actually, these things don't come from a certain source. This etheric uh, egoic entity doesn't have to come from an egg or, you know, a fetus or whatever, or a machine even. It's, it's something that's, that's there, almost like it's imbued. And that's what tells me uh, that magic's real because I can imbue, um, a, a perfect example is a pet rock. You know, in the 70s, everyone had a pet rock. And once you have that pet rock for just a few days, it's no longer disposable. You, you, it's really expensive to throw that rock away or to toss it back into the river. It, it's, you have imbued it with who you are. In fact, it's so powerful. It's so powerful that you could lose that rock and 60 years later, find it. And only that rock, only for you, would activate, would explode in your endocrine system these feelings which whatever those feelings are, you know, that are tied up with that. It's, it's a very powerful force. Right. So we're talking about an inanimate object 
that, that has no technical imbuing to it. There's not like a process. It's just simply right. you had it, which just really proves where, what true power is, what prana really is. It's literally our will, our belief, you know, will is, is a power, but a belief is like a direction of that power, you know, like a vector almost. So the vector of belief. Yeah. Um, and etymology, is, uh, the etymology of belief is German and it comes from Liebe, which is love. Uh -huh. So it's a belief is a love, an idea that you love so much, really, that you're you would willing to die for it, almost like your child, right? Oh, wow. Yeah. That's why people get triggered by people that attack beliefs, because you love it. Yeah, exactly. Yep. You've got all your goes, in the corner. It also goes into uh, the same thing I was asking uh, earlier with regard to um, when, when I was raised as a witness, I had these questions about... Uh, demon interaction because the people that would complain about it and and within the dogma uh there was like step-by-step -step process that you should use uh -huh. uh, if you're experiencing demon activity so one of them is you pray first you uh -huh. pray to general god help me locate this and then you start looking for items physical items did you buy something at a garage sale why yes i did it was that painting over there well grab that painting say a prayer and light it on fire. You have to use fire to emulate the thing and get rid of it because you don't want to pass that object onto somebody else. So my question always was, what is it about demons attaching themselves to physical objects? Mm -hmm. Like it, as, as it's a key or a pass. Yeah. If someone is utilizing this, you have the right to actually torment that person in some way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So very, very fascinating. So you're touching on that. Just like I could grab this mouse and start really emoting about it and really getting passionate about this mouse and it will imbue or take on some of that characteristic that I'm imparting to it. Yep. And three months from now, like a battery, you could forget about that mouse. And when you see it, you're going to, you're going to get a bump back from that mouse because you, you imbued it with something. This is what a teddy bear is. This, ah, yes. This is what a blankie is. You know, th these are all those things. And that's why it's a mistake to burn the painting. However, you would have to burn the painting if that's how you believe it, you know, because your belief is your direction. Of, so I'm not saying that, that you shouldn't burn the painting, but I'm saying that technically you don't have to burn that painting. Instead, what it is. Yeah, um, it, it correlates with the burning thing, too. So that's, that's uh, JW kind of a dogma. Uh, a separate book I just finished reading a couple of weeks ago is on egregors. And in that, uh, the author is talking about how um, he left a Buddhist um, Western organization mm -hmm. uh, because it was no longer serving him. It was actually harming him. And they were so emotionally wrapped up into the master that was heading it uh, that he took one of the robes that was given to him by one of his peers and he goes through a ritualistic thing where he finally burns it. Mm -hmm. He says that's the only way you get rid of that egregor mm -hmm. once and for all, when you completely stop paying attention to it. So you've got the prana, you know, uh, um, payoff. And if you want to move in another direction and not have that affect you anymore, you, you emulate it. And, and that's emulate. a great way to do it. Yeah. Whatever the process is that's going to get you to release the will in the right vector to banish or to call, you know, your prana to personify. Think about it. You're, yeah. To call a demon into existence, you were personifying a bundle of prana. You were giving that prana, you know, it's a certain size. It only has a certain small life form. And this is why I, I go back to what I was saying that demons don't lie. The reason why they don't lie is because the code is just too heavy. Like you could make a, don't get me wrong. You could make a demon that lies, but you're looking at a super heavy piece of code. You know, you're looking at like an Apple Siri, right? That's yeah. running inside that chat window versus just a simple, you know, JavaScript, you know, that's just like, Hey, hot stuff. How are you? You know, it's just two totally different pieces of code. And it just, it's not very practical to build that much software into a demon where, because if you think about lying is an extremely complex act. It requires yeah. multiple timelines where you're remembering things that are, you know, completely different than what actually is. And that's setting up a whole lot of, of memory. You know, you're, you're pulling a lot of memory in. And 
because the demon's running off of me, whoever's possessed by it, all that life force is being required to generate the software, you know, to run that process, which is going to, it's going to cause it, uh, it's going to be much easier for me to go, I don't like this demon. This demon's eating too much of me. You know, I, I can't move my arm right now because this demon has this piece of software where it's rendering 16,000 triangles, you know, every frame per second. And it's just sucking me dry. So you're going to be more quick to expunge that demon. But if it's a nice small demon that doesn't have the ability to lie, you know, that's just rendering three or four triangles a second, your processor is going to be okay with that. It's no different than the remora, the, the little fish that attaches underneath, you know, a, a whale shark or a regular shark. It's going to, you know, the bigger that remora, the less chance that shark's going to let it stay there. You know, oh, it's yeah. be just so right. It is less of a nuisance. Yeah. Same thing. The little birds on the back of a rhino or a hippopotamus and not a giant crane. Yeah. yeah. You got it. Yeah, you got it. Exactly. And that's why I come back to, to just reemphasize, you know, here's how demons work. They're, they, they have to tell the truth just because they're simple. They're, they have to avoid the pit. They want to stay in a loop. You know, they want to stay in the process loop. That, that's their most important thing. They don't have vendettas. They don't have a long-standing attachment to you. They don't even know who you are if you think about it. They're literally just out there like, how can I get more life force? You know, if they could possess a ladybug, they would do that. You know, if they could possess a rooster, they would do that. And they probably do. Um, you know, but that, This is interesting. It brings up another point about how many demons can possess at one time. Now, there's a scripture in the Christian Greek, Legion. Are you familiar with that one? No. Called Legion, because we are many. Mm -hmm. So Jesus cast out a demon in a, a demon-possessed man, or I should, I should rephrase that. He cast out a demon of a possessed man who, prior to the dismissal, said, wait, 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 wait. Cast us into those swine over there. All right, fine. Go into the swine. And then all these swine ran off a cliff and killed themselves. Wow. So now what is that about? They needed to be released. Why into the swine first? And then why kill yourself while you're in a swine? Mm -hmm. So uh, if you talk, uh, is it Roman? So a legion is how many in a, in Roman army? I don't know. So anyway, we'll just keep it at many. So have you ever heard about, um, is there a limit, size limit? Are most people possessed by 10, 12 <laughs> or more? Oh, it's a good question. I, I, I don't know, you know. It, it, it would, it, it's interesting because as we're talking, like thinking about the rooster and stuff, it, I bet you that the reason why Hillary Clinton had to kill 20 white roosters in order for Bill Clinton to be elected attorney general was because each rooster before she was killing it, she was imbuing that rooster. She was possessing that rooster with her spirit. Yeah. Now, she's an idiot, so she, she, you know, she thought, well, I'm, I'm calling this other spirit uh, Lamenko. I, I can't remember the name. But anyway, she was calling the spirit and putting it into the rooster. Yeah. And she was sacrificing that. like she, you know, she was using that. And each time she does that, the adrenaline from her having to kill these roosters, she's never done that before. So, you know, she's sweating her ass off. She's like, God, this is freaking weird. You know, it's like yeah. all that energy is building up. That tension is building up. And that's why magic works. That's yeah. why black magic, it's not about, well, no, you, you've, you've left out a syllable here. It's not about, oh, well, you know, these are bones from a chicken, not from a rooster. It, it's all about the belief inside. And that's why some of these rituals are so detailed and exacting. For example, John D. Um, you know, his, his rituals were just fucking insane, like autistic nightmare, you know, of like <laughs> really long incantations, you know, yeah. you have to, it's putting you in that mantra. Right. He's putting himself in that mantra of this is so complex. How could it not work? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it's like, it, and it wouldn't work as well for D it would work as well for anyone else who reads it. Because D already knows what he's doing, but the next person just sees all this mumble with all these charts and all these symbols and everything's got arrows and you got to take a compass and you got to line this up and it's got to be on. So you're like, of course this works. Who the fuck would make this shit up? But like, yeah, exactly. who? And that's why all this stuff works. That, that, that's really why magic works. That's why it really doesn't make a lot of sense 
for you to be spending all this time studying the exact writings of John D or of Aleister Crowley or of anyone else. These are right. just fucking uh, prana jackers. That's really all they are. They're just people that have just learned how to jack the prana. That's why Satanists want to always push their gag reflexes because what's happening if you're, if you're forcing yourself to eat donkey sperm like Joe Rogan, like each time you're doing that, your adrenaline is fucking going through the roof. You're like, I can't believe I'm doing this. this is so gross. That yeah. adrenaline is then directed into the prana. And that's why on dark magic, you always have to do worse than you did last time because yeah, you, can be, you have to get really challenging, right? Yeah. It's all about the adrenaline. Yeah. John, it has nothing to do with anything else except for adrenaline. It has nothing to do with the God you invoke. It has nothing to do with the evil or the good you invoke. It has nothing to do with the plane you're on with the, the demon name, with the month, with the stars. It has nothing to do with that. All of the power is inside of us. The adrenaline that allows a mother to pick up a Buick to save her son has zero spellcraft in it. It's not like she knew the magic words, you know, to say. Right. It's not like she was wearing a, you know, she took her tampon out last month and fed it to a whale on a Sunday, but only after a blue moon. You know, it's not. Right. It's she had the will. She had the will to lift the fucking car. She yeah. believed more than anything else in her world. I have to lift this car now. That's right. what's happening. That's why words like placebo, that's why we have the placebo effect in science. Yeah. Yeah. This is our magic being hidden away from us. It's, yeah. This is explained, why relativity... Explained away, yeah. This is why relativity attacks uh, the ether and replaces it with the vacuum of space. Because ether is probably the living nebulous of will. And if we've got a science that's telling us, no, everything outside of you is a vacuum... It's literally the psychology of it is, is that you're picturing your prana once it goes up in the air being sucked, you know, like yeah. an eternal, ever cool. expanding, yeah. destroying, terrible whole place. Yeah. Uh, and it's funny, but what is a demon pit, but outer space? Like, what yeah, does it, it look like? But, uh, you know, a zero, I forget the term for that, but there's like, we can't even reproduce a pure vacuum on earth. It's just too powerful. It's, it's, it's too hard to do that. Yeah. That would make sense that that's what the demon, all of these alchemists are putting the demon pit all around us. They, they, they want us to feel that way. They want us to feel like we're in that prison, like an X-Men where all the lights are off and there's this, single box <laughs> that's floating in the center of this ever expanding emptiness, you know, and they have yeah. to build out a little ramp to get to it, you know, and it's, that's how they want you to think of your psyche, that you're completely cut off from all the magic, from all the world, oh, yeah. from all your prana, you know, from the ether, basically. And it makes sense. Well, like what I mean is, is if you wanted to control the world and you knew how magic worked, if you knew how prana works, everything I'm talking about would like be a really good strategy, right? Like yep. it, it's like the perfect strategy, which kind of comes back to what I was saying earlier. This is why I believe this stuff is because you could just, you just look at what's happening around you, you know, and go, well, what would make them like, why would they invest so much work? And even though quantum mechanics was disproving Einstein, like within a year, why would they spend so much work pushing that idea? Right. So much work. And I think As that's the, the that's, big caveat. Always beware of celebrity. Always beware. Yep. Of celebrity. If someone is famous, more than likely it's invented. Yep. Yep. I agree completely. It's and the most dangerous thing in the world would be a famous person with free will. If you had yeah. a if Yeah, had, it can influence oh, a lot of people, right? If you had Jesus today, you know, someone who's just purely in the zone, right? Like in flow state. Like if you would ask me, what is Jesus? I would say it's the man in flow state. Like he's just completely cool. yeah. in massive flow state. That's why he's able to heal people. Why is he able to heal? Because people believe in him. They see his flow state. And, and this is, again, comes back to the magic. They see his flow state. They give him all their prana and he's able to just return the same will they put into him to, heal, to clean a possession and really to clean a possession, all you're really doing is just uh, embracing the ego. You're just, you're just, uh, you're, you're, you're having a communion with someone's ego. When someone would meet Jesus and feel better, he was giving them a full communion with their ego. He was bringing it out of them. 
He was like, look, everything you give me in prana, I'm just going to give right back to you. And they're like, okay, Jesus. Like, they didn't even know. They, yeah. they, they, it doesn't matter what Jesus said. This is why it sucks to be Jesus. Because I know Jesus the whole time was like, this is not me. This power's in you. And they're like, oh, Jesus, the power's all in you. No, I swear, it's in you. And they're like, oh, right. And that's so why, <laughs> And that's why he gave that, uh, that famous, you will do things greater than me. If you uh, have faith the size of a mustard. Yep. You cut out on Do me. greater things than I do. Yeah. Yep. Back. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's uh I think I think you might uh, can, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Good. It, I was losing you for a while. I can hear you. This is all, all this it's stuff. Coming, that I guess it's coming back, huh? All this stuff that I'm talking about, I'm hoping it'll be in my next book, um, which most of these chapters are already written. Good, good deal. And it's just I outlining this prana economy, you know, and, and how it works. And more importantly, it's really about belief. It's about understanding the technology of belief, you know, how this stuff yep. actually works and trying to peel it away from religion because religion is what tries to steal it. Religion tries to say, no, 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 all these powers come through us through the church, through the structure, through the ritual. You know, if you do not say this, if you do not have this ritual of baptism, if you do not have this ritual of confirmation, you know, yeah. you will lose all that magic. And what are you going to do if you believe the church? That's exactly what will happen. You will feel like, right. no, I can't, I can't do that. Uh, re religion uh, does mean to rebind. Ligare is the ligament, wow. uh -huh. right? And re, do again, or re, the sun god, right? Uh -huh. So you're evoking the sun god of Egypt and rebinding whatever. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. And some say, no, 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 you got your Latin wrong. It means to reconnect. Okay, it means both. Right. Because, <laughs> because that's the way they do these things. Mm -hmm. It means this and that. It's not that only. Right, you right. And that's, and that's the other thing. When you get a word, you're like, yes, it means this and it means that. And it means this and this and that and that. And it's just the will of the individual and what it means to them. So, for instance, trigger words, right? Uh, my famous one that I tell people all the time is um, arguing with my wife over the word irk. Because I said, hey, uh, that irks me. Mm -hmm. Well, if it irks you, we might as well just end this right. Oh, okay, good. Because you're frozen. Um, and I said, wait a second, wait a second. What do you think irk means? She's like, extremely angry. Mm. I'm like, I don't feel that it means that. Let's look it up. And we looked it up in the dictionary, and sure enough, it said, mildly annoyed. Right. She goes, well, I, still, you know, she still wanted to cling to the definition of what it meant. It's like, well, we got to come to an agreement here. Let's never use the word irk again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. so that we you know and so, underneath that like underneath that is the prana like yeah. underneath her saying it's the word irk is something totally different happening you know it, it's a it, the words are just excuses words fail us yeah. the currency you know it the currency is already happening underneath the words just try as hard as they can to stop anyone from fucking it up like th that's really all the words are is just to justify the current that's already been established that neuron you know the neurons of prana that have made their connection once it has a flow, it's, it's going to say whatever it says to be like, don't mess with this. This is a good flow we got, you know, where someone else who feels vampired from it would be like, I don't like this flow. Uh, both of them are using words, but none of them are actually saying, hey, this energy is pranically taxing or, you know, I, I can't contribute to this. No one's saying that. It's always about the words. It's always about the rational mind. It, it's, it's the most frustrating thing I have when I'm telling someone about mind control because they keep thinking that it's thought control yeah. and it's not, it's chemical control. It's the chemicals. In my opinion, it's the chemicals that are causing the prana to send and be received. It's a much more reptilian in the sense of like in our core brain, yeah. it's much more reptilian where we're not even allowed to have a rational, uh, coat check at the beginning of it. Like we can rationally see what's happening and stop it. 
but I don't think that we are ever going to be able to quickly rationally beat, beat it to the, the punch. In other words, that prize is going to come through our reptilian aspect of it. All we can do is catch it and then try and stop it, redirect it, change it, you know, whatever. It's never going to be this idea where it's the thought happens. I am now going to begin a prana dump with Jonathan. Like it, it, <laughs> it's not how it's going to happen. It's right. going to be something totally different. You and I made a chemical agreement, you know, weeks ago, yeah. with, you know, when we were like, Hey, let, let's sit here and meet and all day today in your mind. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying you obsessed over, but you know, all day today in your mind, you're like, I'm talking to James today. And all day today in my mind, I'm like, I'm talking to John then today. Right. The whole time I'm, I'm giving us prana you know, I'm putting prana in the pot, you know, yep. John that's coming today, you know, uh, make sure I don't have boogers on my nose, make sure, right. you know, it, whatever. It's all those things are just ritual for this right. prana. And the uh, same thing, same thing if I called you on the phone and say, hi, I'm from X and so clearinghouse. Mm -hmm. You just won $1 billion. Right. You know, now from that point forward, I could be a liar, yeah. but until there's, proof that it's not coming you still have the same effect within your energy being yeah you are elated and you feel free because yeah. you have a lot of your problems yeah you it's know? the anticipation is the is anticipation is this is the finest painter in the world it, like once you get the mind into this anticipation it, you really can lead them literally anywhere that, that's what's happening with q right now that's what's happening with, with so many things that are around right now. It's once you can establish an anticipation uh, addiction, you can literally lead anybody anywhere, especially if you can make them uncomfortable. You know, if they're uncomfortable in their situation, the anticipation is a leash and it's very easy to lead this person along, you know, to another pasture. Enjoy the show and what's the other term? Follow the plan or trust the plan. Trust, trust the, the plan. plan. Yep. Enjoy the show. Trust the plan eat popcorn. Um, all these things are the savior ascension anticipation. Yeah, the prog that program's been running. And what's funny is that um, you'll have people that say, yeah, I'm a see religion has the savior program. And then you go, but so does politics. Mm -hmm. So does Monsanto. Yeah. Well, under it's a lie. There's a so guy. Climate change. So does climate yeah. change. Yeah. Climate change. Yeah. 5g, all of it. This is all about, and, and, and I, when I see a very big polarity, you know, like 5G is going to kill all of us, and then 5G is a savior. Mm -hmm. Well, which is it? You know, and you have very intelligent people on both sides of the fence exposing their belief as to why it's good or bad. I just wrote an article uh, called Billion Dollar Liars, and it just has to do with Epstein. But I, I was telling a story because I once asked for capital funding from a venture capitalist and I wanted $200,000 but my mentor said no James you're going to have to ask for 7 million and and it was a real big lesson for me because my my friend was right my mentor was right but what he was telling me is is James you want to hook he didn't say these words but you know you want to hook their belief you want you want to provide them with a salvation solution Nothing amazing costs two hundred thousand dollars. The only thing amazing out there is going to have to cost seven million. Do you see what I'm saying? Like it, it was, Absolutely. it was a necessary part of the belief. Even if we took that money and just left it in the bank, it still would be working because it's creating that illusion of this is this is going to save everything. How do you know that? Because it costs seven million dollars, or this is not going to save anything. How do you know that? Because it only costs two hundred thousand dollars. It's it's a it's all part of the spell. It's, it's, that's why Epstein is so popular. He was, people were told he was a billionaire. I don't even know if he actually was one, but they were told he was a billionaire. And just by being told that, the second he walks into a room, where's all the prana going? Where's all that life force going? Anyone in the room is going to automatically give their life force to the billionaire. It's not even going to be something they want to do. They could hate Epstein. And guess what? If you hate Trump, if you love Trump, you're still giving him your life force. So even if they were rationally against it, they're still giving him all the life force. Even if they, even if they found a way to not do it, as soon as they turn to their neighbor to have a conversation, that conversation is going to be about Epstein.
because your neighbor's giving you him all the life force. So there's this economy, this prana economy is completely unavoidable. You can be the strongest alchemist in the world, but unless you're a hermeticist living in a cave, you were subject to the media that's around you. And all of us are, are regurgitating media every single day. There's nothing we can do about that. It's true. You know, you know Epstein right now. We didn't even, none of us had an agreement like last time. Oh, we're both going to understand who Epstein is. Like, I didn't even say his first name. You know, I, I just, I knew exactly that you would know what I mean. It's, it's yeah. all part of this where, you know, some prawn is easy, some prawn is a lot more expensive. You know, if I was to say, no, the, the Alan Parsons Project's first band was called the Experimental Eight. I'm making this up, but you know, and, and it's, I gotcha. you know, it, it would take a lot more prana for me to get you excited about them as it would about Epstein or the Beatles or, you know, Gaga or whatever. Even if it's good or bad, it doesn't matter. It's, I can say that word and instantly inside of your head, all these neurons are going to go. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. And, you know, and it's, um, I don't easily get caught up in uh, save your memes, you know, uh, but it's just, it's so in there. It's like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, I'd like a global currency reset. Mm -hmm. I'd like a revaluation of our currency and have things be more fair and not based on the Fed. Mm -hmm. And then. You get pumped up into that belief and then there's always some sort of letdown. Yeah. And that's, how, that's how a black magician, you know, they know how to do that. That's why Trump is promising a wall. He knows that's something he can deliver that's tangible. Like, yeah. so all he had to do is months and months ago, all he had to do is say, and I heard you guys want a wall, right? And everyone's <laughs> going to naturally, the first time he said that, everyone's going to naturally go, yeah right and then he's going to go to the next city boy i was in kansas city we're going to build a wall and then everyone's going to be like yeah so you're literally building an economy right you're 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 marketing a product a salvation product you're imbuing the salvation inside a wall and you're ex you're uh soliciting excitement from this it would no different than jesus saying I got my sandals from Hassam's sandal shop in 1641 Rome Boulevard. Like everyone's going to be like, dude, I got to get some sandals from Hassan. It's there's, there's no way around it. It's right. completely unavoidable. It's so easy once you understand how it works. And at the end of the day, Trump's going to look like the Aslan of Narnia, the, the great salvation because he delivered something that he in, inserted into the mind to want. So of course it's going to work. And of course he's going to seem super powerful um, because he's controlling every aspect of it. There's not a two way communication. Not one of us gets to go. Like if the world worked where people got to listen to me or you for three minutes, every time Trump talked, it would not work, you know, <laughs> but because we don't have that voice, all you have is one speaker and that speaker's owned by the alchemist, you know, who's casting that spell. There's nothing really you can do about it. Right. at least until more of us learn how learn how prana works yeah but, but and, there's and, not and, and i think the biggest thing with that is is uh, the focus and the attention we are so scattered and distracted our minds have to go like this in order to survive currently yeah and i think it's a matter of bringing those back in so that you have singular focus again with intention and purpose on in the moment mm -hmm. it, so once that's fulfilled, then you move on to the next thing of focus. Yep. Right now, uh, what's cherished is multitasking, mm -hmm. right? Which divides that energy up and scatters it. And typically, men are better at focus than women are because yeah. of, of just the nature of it, mm -hmm. way of thinking. So great for radar technicians, right? Tracking multiple targets at once. I don't have a uterus, so I can't do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what I have is a penis and I can focus on one thing. Yep. Yep. One yep. shiny object at a time. Uh, so you put people of their skill set where they're needed would be the logical thing. Instead of all this fighting over a, a, a five foot Filipino woman who weighs a hundred pounds that wants to be a firefighter. Mm -hmm. Well, Hey, join the firefighting team and be supportive, but no one in the right mind would put you in the lead to go, carry my ass out of a burning building. You can't yeah. carry it. Drag my ass down the stairs and I'll get a concussion. Mm -hmm. you know, so, but just so much fragmentation.
So. Yeah. Well, that's why, that's why the salaries are split the way they are. That's why actors are actually heralded the most. They get the most money. They get the most fame. They get trophies every year because society wants us to be actors. In order to be an actor, you have to be able to follow the script. In order to follow the script, you have to not care what you say. You have to be able to uh, betray your voice box, basically not live in integrity in your voice box. That's yeah. a form of disassociation. You know, that's why an actor loses their name when they go to Hollywood. It's all a dissociation. And if we're part of the ritual, most, yeah. when we're paying the actors the most, we're telling the world, hey, the prana economy works the best if you play the role of actor. It works the second best if you play the role of doctor and the third best if you play the role of lawyer. All of those are costumed jobs. All three of those jobs involve the use of costume to create an interpersonal, a, a subpersonal or an abpersonal relationship. You don't have a relationship with Bob the doctor. You have a relationship with a doctor. The same as you have a relationship with a lawyer. A, a lawyer you can lie to. A lawyer will lie on your behalf. This is not a human. This is a, uh, it's, it's a costume. Same with a, 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 an actor. An actor is a liar. They're a professional liar that does it for a living. That's so the true. society yeah, that's... is pushing all of us to disassociate, to value whoever disassociates is the person that, that we consider the highest ideal. Yeah, and uh, on that point, uh, a lawyer is not an attorney. A lawyer is, if you will, a student of law. Mm -hmm. Whereas an attorney is someone who is supposed to turn you back towards the public and into that jurisdictional place wow. where they can control you. Uh, they turn you away from your own private independence and into the system. Wow. So attorneys are demons <laughs> that grab you and bring you back into the system. That's brilliant, John. Yeah, really, they're human daemons. You could call, I've never thought of it this way, but you, you know, an actor, a professional actor is a human daemon. Professional doctor is a human daemon. That's why they get so mad when you question, question. vaccines are safe and effective. That's why they get so angry. They're, yeah. I don't have this in my program. Why, why they, are you doing yeah, that? And they, and they spit out the program. Uh, so, yeah. hey, doctor, I heard that um, vitamin C therapy can really help and cure cancer uh you just do mega dosing right right all of a sudden the heretical response you know you can see the high priest getting inflamed how dare you mm -hmm. burn him at the stake you know i mean how dare you mention a vitamin uh no we need a pharmaceutical which evokes uh, another daemon yeah you're you know? absolutely right and those uh, daemons are going to have children uh, I mean, we're going to have children under possession of those daemons. And, you know, then you talk about epigenetic possession, which is very real. Yeah. And, you, you know, we are living in a society where we are born possessed uh, from yeah. our own genetic True. code uh, to uh, be more see. open to more demons coming in. Yeah, uh, that reminds me of a book. Let's see real quick if I can. Get that's here. why alcoholism is hereditary while you're looking that up. You know, that's why, that's why alcoholism is such a hereditary thing. It's because that possession is able to be passed down through the family. I think it's uh, it was called it didn't start with you so um it's a book about how you might have some weird thing that you do not understand why is it that i keep why am i attracted to women mm -hmm. who are not available to me right. they're all married women it could be that your grandfather because that's how the epigenetic works it seems mm -hmm. to jump a gen uh that he had an issue with it and you are now here to work that out mm -hmm and finalize it finalize the program and send it on its way send the program to the to the pit i like that yeah exactly that's a big part of it in fact uh from reading all that work on on demons i actually think whenever you see a possession is performed you're actually creating a demon you're you're not actually expunging one because you're 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 literally personifying the demon in a ritual in front of that person so now an authority in a, in a robe, right? A disassociated authority has come in and has imbued <laughs> your prana as real. It's made it 20 times more powerful. And, and that's why it's just so, so fucked up how the whole world and they is use it, And the use of costumes. So mm -hmm. why does a cop dress the way he does? Yep. Why does the judge wear a black robe? Mm -hmm. 
why are attorneys for the most part asked to dress up as businessmen? Yep. And all those are possessions. They're possessed in the sense that they become demons, but also they possess us because we see their costume and the same sigil is able to carry over from the last time, from the last time, from the last time. We're rewarded for, for listening to the law. We're punished if we don't. Uh, you know, the exact same things are, are, are implemented every time. Well, and, and a lot of this stuff is binding. So like what happens, I'm sure you've heard this before, but um, you, you're born – to a man and woman within the matrix. Mm -hmm. They've already set agreements in motion. Everything is under contract, right? Everything's an agreement. So it's just that there's no full disclosure. Mm -hmm. If you knew the full disclosure, you wouldn't agree to some of this stuff. So for instance, when you are born, your father, the patriarch, under a patriarchal rule, has seven days to claim you as his son or daughter. Mm -hmm. When that does not happen, you are abandoned. You are an abandoned vessel. And so what takes place is that then your mother gets a certificate. The birth certificate is the same as you would find when declaring cargo, bringing it in into the country. Yeah, yeah. It is then given a number, and it can be traded on the stock market as a commodity. So... Both parents have abandoned the child. So the child immediately with birth certificate becomes a ward of the state. And so you, you as the parents are handy. Hey, would you like to take care of our possession? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, raise it. So that's why social services, if they want to, they have full authority at a whim to come and take your children away. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not giving them the vaccinations that we thought they should have. So you are abusive parents and now we can take, and then they go to fight in court and they lose. Why? Because mm -hmm. when the child was born, you abandoned it mm -hmm. unbeknownst to you, but you gave it away. So you don't have a right to say, because it's not your property. Yeah. And the same is happening with our currency. This hit me today as I was driving up here. Um, if, if a court can garnish your wages, a court really owns your wages. Like those actually belong to the court and they're just happen to allow everyone to keep their wages right now. But if yeah. we're setting up a system where, where that's how it works, we're literally saying that all, all of your resources, all the energy that you earn, all the, all the sweat and equity that you put into something actually doesn't belong to you. It belongs to a court and they're yeah. the ones actually who decide who gets it, how much of it you get to keep, how much of it you don't right. get to keep but we're still it's blissfully a, walking around pretending like we're free men because we have these sigils like the American flag or the, you know, all these. Right. Other, and and through our parents we're taught about this concept of authority, right? Which is jurisdiction. And the Latin jurisdiction means juris law and diction. Like I can talk into my phone and dictate say the law is what I say it is. Wow. And your parents told you that too all, all the time. Jurisdiction yeah. is, Hey, I said so. So do it. That's brilliant, Jonathan. Yeah, that's astute. <laughs> wow, that's great. That makes total sense. And, and the yeah. whole time, even if we don't know that word, we're still held responsible for the meaning of that word. We're still, we're still under that contract. It's so sinister. It's really, oh, oh, really bad. Hugely. Yeah. No, it's a, it's. I call it the big con, mm -hmm. and it's part. Of, so here we are, brought into the matrix, and really, it is a system of lies. So I stopped asking. And in a lot of ways, are they lying to me? And it's what aren't they lying about? Mm -hmm. the, the them, the they, the other, you know? Yep. And, some, and sometimes when you put a little bit of meditative thought into it, it gets uh, on the border of uh, almost insanity. If you, you know, like you're, you're just rubbing up against that insane, whatever it is, mm -hmm. you can touch it and you feel that insane energy and it, it does, it's, it's repelling and sometimes a little fearful and just, I got to calm down right now. You know, <laughs> I got to refocus on something and uh, that'll make me feel a little better. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, and then people like us and, uh, you know, the, the loose knit Neil Kramer group that you were introduced to, you know, we're constantly, what is the truth of the matter? Mm -hmm. You know, what should we be focusing our energies on? And, uh, me and uh, I think uh, the other Jonathan, um, we kind of hold space for the shape of the earth. There's this debate about flat versus sphere. 
And we're like, hmm, we're just kind of open to whatever because there have been some very smart people on both sides that have compelling arguments. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, yeah. Yeah, you have to ask, go, well, at present, is it something worthy of my attention? Because I have the, I don't really have the means in a scientific way. Mm -hmm. I have probably other means and ways of discerning it that are not, that I'm not privy to right now, but I can't launch a rocket. I don't have the means to go up there and see for myself if mm -hmm. what the truth of the matter is, you know? And then I often wonder, well, does it matter at this stage anyway? I'm, I'm going internal. I'm looking internal. I'm seeking answers from within. So I imagine at some point I will run across the truth of that. Mm -hmm. um, is that similar to what you're going through? Um, I just wrote an article called Flat Earth Karate. And it, it's, right. it's, it's describing flat earth as a pose that you would take in the dojo where, hey, uh, Mr. Miyagi, I, man, you got kicked me in the nuts last time. Like, it just really hurt. W what can I do? There's so many lies out there. I'm getting punched in the nuts all the time by all the lies. And Miyagi goes, well, try this new stance. And you go, okay, what's it called? It's called flat earth. And when I go out into the street and I live a flat earth psychology, I'm automatically seeing everything as a lie, like literally everything. Yeah. This stance has advantages and it has disadvantages. No different than any other karate stance you would take. Uh, flat earth requires the most calories out of any other stance in the world. Flat earth requires the most because yeah. you're surrounded. Remember the prana chips we're talking about? You're yeah. surrounded where each chip you put out is expensive, man. I mean, people, they ridicule you. They get angry at you. It's a really expensive thing to feel flat earth unless you're inside of like a dojo with other like minds. But for the most part out there in the world, we're surrounded by globalists, ball earthers that, that are going to get really angry at you because you're threatening their stance. Because of that, flat earth is a psychology that I don't think any of us can keep 24-7. I just think it's too expensive. It's, it's yeah, um, I actually, it's interesting that you say that. Uh, I experimented with it. I looked about uh, into it and I wore it for about 24 hours. Mm -hmm. That's it. Today, it's all about I'm living on a flat plane. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the 24 hours, I was exhausted. Yep. And, and, you, and the whole time you're stalking yourself going, damn it, I, I actually, no, I, I missed it. You know, like here's a seven minute period <laughs> where I was actually thinking it was round, you know, because I know this because of this, or I said this, yeah. or I was talking about satellites, or I was doing this yeah. or whatever. It, it's a... It's a, it's a very difficult yoga pose is what it is. And, and so that's how I look at it. I, I am, the zeteticism is the way to put the assemblage point back in the body. Your, your vector, you know, your, your vector where you're going to render the world is taught to be outside the body. We're taught to be outside looking at us to make yeah. sure our behavior isn't fucked up. I, I, zeteticism takes that and puts it inside again. And now I don't care what I look like. I, I can be the guy at karaoke that just sings horribly, like horribly, but I'm still having fun. Like yeah. I'm, still, I'm still able to really enjoy myself, even though everyone's laughing or, or they're throwing up or whatever. Yeah. That's where we all need to be. We need to be uh, you know, a goose singing karaoke. It's just the god awfulest sound, but we need to think we're, we sound like Billy Joel. And, and to me, that's what Flat Earth does. It... it it really seats you back inside yourself. And that's why I keep saying to me, it's not about words anymore. This is all about the prana underneath it. And the moment I invoke flat earth, um, with the exception of all the pushback I get, the internal part of it is so much more peaceful because I, I'm, these guys lie about everything. It, it's, it's a real bad mistake that we keep trying to say, yeah, but I bet you they're telling the truth about this. I mean, it's just, just one thing. Yeah, it's just kind of getting out of hand. Because if you think about it, what is the purpose of lying? They don't lie once. They want lies on top of lies on top of lies on top of lies. Because, it, and so why? And I, chronically, that, that causes confusion. It causes you to redirect and drain your own uh, prana. For example, ego. People are ego shaming, people shame the ego all the time. Uh, you know, they're always saying your ego's too big or your ego's evil. You know, this idea that Freud wanted to have sex with his mother was a psyop, 
where they, they infested all of us with the idea that ego is evil. All of us want to have sex with our mom and we need to be as meek as possible and to constantly be flogging ourselves in public for virtue. And then um, what's interesting is that um, ego as a thing versus what I now understand it as ego as process Mm -hmm. because it's always ever there. So it's like there's choices to be made. And as I make a choice, I make right choices, don't I? Mm -hmm. Of course I do. There you go. Ego arises. Yep. I don't make bad choices. I only do what's good for myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to marry her, drink this, not eat that. Mm-hmm. Ego's always ever arising out of the choices we make. Yeah. And it, it gets stronger and thicker. It, it grows a, a more powerful skin. Uh, now demons will try and attack me. And if I'm feeling really good about myself and I, I don't even feel them, like my ego is so much larger than my energy body that they don't even get to graze me anymore. They, they just, you know, that's why racism, if someone calls me racist, it doesn't, it doesn't affect me. If someone calls me sexist, it doesn't affect me. If someone calls me xenophobic, it doesn't affect me. Why? Because a long time ago, I said, I'm going to stop treating my ego like shit. The next time someone tells me I'm an evil fucking racist, I'm going to look at them and say, no, I'm not. And the, the first time I do that, it's hard because they're going to attack you like crazy. But the 10th time I do that, I'm building an outer shell that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's a good thing. Yeah. If more people had a stronger ego, we wouldn't be so selfish and selfish. We wouldn't be in so much pain. I'm sorry. And the pain is what makes us selfish. We and that's be what so they're... desperate. Like the, like the guy driving, when we were almost out of gas. It's the exact same thing. Your ego's almost out. You're going to be selfish. Then you're going to cut people off in traffic. You're going to, I don't care. You're trying to cross the road. I have to get past you because I could run out of gas right here. It's that's what a low ego does. That's why they, that's why black magicians want the ego low. It allows them to control everything, everything. Makes, makes absolute sense, yeah. And the uh, absconding with the term ego and then turning it into something. So uh, people will not use the proper word. Like somebody can be egoic. Mm-hmm. Wow, he's, he's extremely selfish. He only is concerned with himself. But we don't say that. We say, oh, look at his ego. Mm-hmm. And that guy's got a big ego on him. So it's a pejorative. When yeah means doesn't it mean id isn't it related to id yeah well well, identification we also we also call a big ego someone's ego is out of like a fish that's out of water we call that oh look how big that ego is it's actually the exact opposite the fish is dying for more ego that fish is going to die any minute now that's why it's flopping around that's why you're seeing it flop around, but you're calling, oh, well, if your ego wasn't so big, I mean, literally you're telling the fish, you should be ashamed of yourself for flopping around right now. Yeah. And what happens if the fish buys that? They're going to get even worse. Like it's, it's just going to be worse. It's only going to be worse. And they're going to slowly, they're going to get yeah. their freaking daily ration of prana if they agree to it. So, so they're getting just enough prana, you know? That's what the virtue signaling is all about. They're getting yeah. just enough, but it's only through a communist system where it's like, no, no, no. Oh, you got to yeah. go around to the front and there's a guy at the desk and he's going to give you this, but only if you say this is, oh, you got white skin. Oh, oof. that's going to cost mm, you. Yeah. Is in there? Oh my goodness. Wow. That's bad. You know? And so all these things are processed as you go through the line, as you get your gruel on the tray. And, and that's really what Satanism is all about. It's that satanic system yeah. of harvesting energy and releasing it in, in, on the dole, on the constriction where you're, you know, you're, you're wrapping you're your, it out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And since make everybody a victim, everyone want, looks to mommy and daddy as the state, please take care of me because I'm afraid. Yep. All the boogeymen that are around me. I, in fact, I'm afraid of myself. So can you control me too? Yep. You know, full surrender. So you become literally the battery as depicted in the matrix. Exactly. And that's why when we're told um, to check our ego, we're literally shorting our, our own battery out. We're taking the positive and the negative and we're touching those wires together. And if we do that, if we short ourselves out, someone will give us a little prana cookie and go, oh, here you go. That's a good job. <laughs> you know, and that's the only food you'll get. And that's, that's how the entire economy works. That's why I think people, that's what jealousy really is. Um, a jealousy is the evacuation of self. You're, a jealous fish would be a fish that's seeing another fish in the water. 
like having plenty of water to breathe and him not having any. It's, it's, it's the missing of the self. But, but we treat that the opposite, you know, we, we, yeah. because we shame the ego, we're saying, well, you need to lose yourself even more, you know, yeah, your self-esteem then, uh, would improve if you weren't so egoic. It's just like, what? And so um, now through the Western, like you said, Freud, through the Western system, uh, the psyop of, oh, Freud was wrong. He wanted to have sex with his mother. Everything's about sex with him. Mm-hmm. And uh, from the Eastern side, we have, you cannot have nirvana if you're so full of ego. Is that is that a correct statement? I don't know a whole lot about Buddhist. I think that philosophy. the Western, I think the Westernized version of that is that. I think the ego does come in there, you know. You know, the Buddhist is just, as long as you, it's so, see, I don't like bashing on Buddhism, but it really is dangerous. Yeah. It's very much a nihilistic program of, yeah. of you know. Well, um, see, I go back to the thought, all, capital A, all, <laughs> All of it is bad. Mm-hmm. It was invented to control. That's yeah. why there's the term called religion. In fact, uh, JWs didn't start off as a religion at all. It was a Bible study group. It's called the International Bible Students Association. They used to march outside of churches, various denominations, with placards and sandwich boards. And they would say, religion is a snare and a racket. Wow. That took some balls back in the 19, yeah. you know. 1920s and whatever, uh, and it did cause some flogging and some tar and feathering and, and that type of thing. But that's ballsy. You were going out saying religion is a snare and a racket. But then eventually, they become victims to their own. You know, they became a religion. So now yeah. they're binding people and mind controlling them. You know, so uh, nothing escapes. And I I agree with uh, Mark Passio on that one, which he said, uh, and he constantly talks about. It. He goes, yeah. All religions are bad except mine. Mine escaped the the clutches of the cabal. Yeah. Only mine. We yeah. were unique, you know. And of yeah. course, you dive into it and you look at the belief system, and of course, there it is. There's a savior. When it, all, when it all comes down to it, it all really comes down to sovereignty. And it, religion would not be corrupted if everyone who followed it or was a part of it or found it enjoyable was sovereign. You know, if if, if sovereignty literally means I have to own every prana cookie of my consent i cannot give someone false consent i i I can't do that it 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 means i can't live in a a taxation system it means i can't live in a military where i'm supporting a military it it, someone got pissed at me today because i told them well jesus actually supported slavery they were like how dare you and i'm like render unto caesar Caesar. what belongs to caesar so so you're you're using the same scripture i use with people um, I just had this same similar conversation with someone uh, about five days ago. Uh, it, it was a friend. He he meant well, but I haven't been around in the organization for over 10 years. He's like, I really want you to come back. And I go, well, I understand, but not the entire Bible is inspired of God, and I can prove it by one scripture. Mm-hmm. Why would the supreme creator of the entire universe, who provides abundantly, so, like, if you and I got on a spaceship and went to a two-per, you know, I'm, I call it the two-person planet analogy, and we went to a planet where there is no other human life, and the door opens, I jump out on the dirt and go, "Shotgun, all mine." Mm-hmm. You would look at me like, "Are you insane? What's all yours? Everything, the whole entire planet, it's mine." Mm-hmm. And if you want to walk on it, you have to pay me. Mm-hmm. You know, so this the. The mind, the all, the divinity, the the source, whatever you want to call it, provides for abundant life because it wants people to express themselves and experience this thing called life in the material sense. And so for an inspired agent or God himself, if you wanted to say that uh, in the Bible, to say, hey, Jesus, uh, should we pay our taxes? Well, give me a coin. Here's a coin. Whose picture's on there? Well, it's Caesar. Well, here you go. Pay Caesar's thing to Caesar's and God's things to God. Mm-hmm. He's telling you to pay taxes. Taxes are, are, are an energy source. It's prana. It's, it's the economy. So you have to take your hard-earned sweat and give it over to somebody who's enslaving you. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I've used the same 
same analogy. And go ahead. Well, what what got me so upset with this person was that they couldn't believe that Jesus could still be Jesus and living in a time of slavery. And I kept trying to explain to them that this is what I mean by owning your consent and sovereignty. It, Jesus could be completely right, completely sovereign, and still accept slavery. The reason why is because everyone who lives under slavery is actually doing that by choice. In, in the North American, uh, in the Civil War, if you were someone that was brought over on a boat from Africa and you did not want to participate in being a slave, they had a word for you. It was called a Seminole or a Seminole, Cherokee. Yeah. yeah. These tribes were made up sometimes as much as one third of escaped slaves or of people that just simply were not going to participate in that. All slavery involves a slave walking by their own volition from one location to another. If we're going to pretend that no one has sovereignty, that, that, that no one has any autonomy at all, and that their own actions of their own feet are actually directed by the property of another, we are taking that person's life force away from them and calling them a piece of property. We are the ones that are sucking that prana out, not them. And that's why I, I was trying to explain to my friend, look, Jesus can still be kick-ass and still live in a system of slavery because right. Jesus owns his consent. He understands that all of us here are here to resolve the alchemy of our consent. We are here to learn how to understand this prana is mine. If, if I'm supporting circumcision, even because I want to pay off my doctor bills, because I have a, you know, a half a million dollars in debt, I'm going to go ahead and cut the doctor's son's penis off because he's, he believes that should happen. It's still his problem. He doesn't get to go home and go, hey, it's just my job, man. I'm just, no, no, you it's don't. No. no, you have to own that. You have to. And, and so Jesus was not. living in that system, but he was surrounded by people that weren't. And it, the consent thing for Jesus to do would be to say, I don't care the words you say. I'm just looking at your prana. You were walking in the field every morning and you were picking cotton. You were walking every morning into a battle with your legion and you were stabbing someone with your blade that was given to you by uh, you know, Rome. It, these are all your choices. Do not look at me and say, oh my God, please help me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have no longer have sovereignty. How I had, no, I, I had no choice. Sovereignty? Yeah. yeah. You never restore sovereignty by saving someone. That's why the expression Jesus saves is literally the darkest, blackest magic you could think of. And that's not Jesus saying that. It's yeah. the church saying that. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so impossible to even breach the subject of Jesus because you're going to lose someone within the first 45 seconds. The second you say, well, he, he, he consented to slavery, they're already gone. They already yeah. think you're talking about, about Jesus. When actually, you're showing empathy to Jesus. You're actually saying, no, actually, here's how it would make sense, you know, that yeah. someone like that who's so woke, who's so sovereign, that he literally gleams sovereignty off of him. And, and what is that? What is full sovereignty except for the most healthy ego you could possibly imagine? Like to be completely sovereign would literally be to have a golden ego like this glowing, pranic aura of, of ego and sovereignty. In fact, the aura could be the ego. It literally, that's what an aura could be. It's just, this is your ego. This is your pranic bubble that you're able to, you know, to grow and ebb and flow. It's so backwards. Everything is backwards. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that famous quote, right? Um, look at us. Everything's backwards. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know? Religion destroys. You cut out on me. You still there? You still there? All right. I told Jonathan I was going to record this. There you are. Now? Can you hear me? How about now? Yeah. Hey, l let me say something to the camera, okay, Jonathan? Sure. Um, I, I asked Jonathan if I could record this like days ago. I, I don't know if he actually knew that I was recording it today because we no, I've been, I've been watching it. Yeah. Great, great. So I just want to wrap this up um, just for the recording part.
Um, sure. I really want to thank Jonathan for, for joining me for this thing. It's the, I'm going to put this on my channel with, with his permission. And, uh, sure. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, and uh, I'm going to sign off now. John and I are actually going to keep talking, but I, I don't want this to be over two hours in case uh, you guys actually watch it. I, I don't want to. I don't want to stretch it too long. So, um, thanks a lot for listening. And you know, hopefully, John will be into us talking more about this. And, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. So please leave some comments. Uh, what do they say on videos? You know, leave comments, like, subscribe. Subscribe. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, and uh, check out my column. And uh, John, do you do you want to send anybody to anywhere? I, I'd be happy to put it in the description or. <laughs> I have no place to go. Great. John and I are <laughs> friends. We met on a, on a group. We just had the most fascinating conversation a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we, we both wanted to just talk to each other more. And three days ago, I was like, you know, if I recorded this, I could answer all those people that are like, how come you're never putting anything on your channel, James? So that's what this is. I'm going to hit uh, sign off on the recording part for now. Uh, thanks a lot, John. I really enjoyed this. Uh, man, you got some great wisdom. Okay. Bye, everybody.